Thank you, ladies. Amen. 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 Um, I wanted to teach this um, lesson for a while. I've, I've taught on it somewhere. Um, you know, as you're old as I am, there's pretty much everything you've taught on. But I wanted to um, <laughs> uh, start off with a, a little story. Uh, um, someone asked me about, um, I was in the grocery store, and they said, what, what does a chaplain do? You know, what, what does a chaplain do? And I said, well, I, I help people. Um, and, you know, if they're in need or in a, a difficult situation and trauma that wrecks or fires or um, things like that, and the, and the young man was looking at me, he said, that sounds pretty neat. And I said, yeah, it is. It is pretty neat um, in helping people. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm glad I got to know you. Can I carry your groceries out? And I said, uh, not this year. Which is my answer nowadays. It's like, not this year, maybe next. And they all grin. You know, it's so funny. But uh, another lady said, because it's difficult to, when you come on scene to make sure you're identified, um, I was able to get a, um, a 2020 Forerunner. I had a truck. And so I realized I needed more space to, to put people in the car if I needed to. So, um, my prayer group decided that I was unadorned in my car. It was just white. And so one of the ladies paid to have decals put on there. So it's got fire chaplain on the front, fire chaplain on the back, and we've got decals and, and, and whatever on the car. And uh, a lady just this last time, I was just in British Columbia, and she said, well, why don't you wear a collar? You know, a collar would identify you. And I, I said... <laughs> Yeah, I guess it would. Um, <laughs> and it reminded me of this story, and this, um, uh, this pastor was, was teaching his, the children of the church about vestments. And, and he asked this little group of kids, he said, can, can you tell me why I wear this collar? And one little boy raised his hand, and he says, it kills fleas and ticks for 30 days. <laughs> <laughs> I just love it when kids just rail, just just derail the train, you know. <laughs> and and I, that's I'm not wearing those. So, um, <laughs> but it's been fun seeing y'all out. I appreciate your kind words. I appreciate um, our all participating together, and and it's always good to laugh. It's so good to laugh with one another and, and to realize that when we laugh, it, it sort of shifts some of that heavy stuff inside of us so God's word can move in, in between those spaces. So if, if you haven't laughed a lot, you need to go to YouTube and, and listen to Leanne Morgan. If you've not listened, Diane and I, she turned on her YouTube last night. And we were laughing so long, loud, you know, Cassandra was like, I heard y'all laughing in your room. I mean, I was laughing so much, I was coughing, cough-causing phlegm and mucus. So I was just like, <laughs> I could not breathe. I had to stand up off the sofa because she's just so dang funny. And she has a very, very uh, stout southern accent from, uh, from, from Knoxville. But if you need to laugh, and she's clean, she's, she, if she ever comes close to you, you need to go hear her because you just will scream for two hours. The woman is funny for two hours. And uh, <laughs> she just is wonderful. So anyway, just a little P.S., public service announcement uh, for you for laughter. And, but I, I want to look at Numbers uh, chapter 22 and if we take it from the King James Version, it's Balaam and his ass. <laughs> well, all right. <laughs> now, this occurs when the children of Israel are still wandering in the desert. 
Um, and what's interesting is, is when you look at that past, if when, you, when you read through and you, you look at them wandering in the desert, although they never wandered, God led them every step of the way. Um, this is in that period of time where a pagan king observes them after a battle and he looks at them as so numerous that he is afraid. And so what's going to happen is, is Balaam is not... Uh, a, a follower of Yahweh. He's a Gentile, and some of the, the sources refer to him as. And he's a soothsayer, a prophesier. And he is known in this area to be able to put curses on people and nations and blessings. So one of the reasons I wanted to bring up this particular passage for us to be conscious of the fact that there is evil in this world. And that the enemy has power. And so we don't have to fear that power, but we need to stand firm in the Lord. And a lot of times, if I'm not in the word enough, then sometimes I get a little off kilter. And that's when the enemy knows he can push me over. And that doesn't mean I stay down. That doesn't mean that we're, you know, um, down and out with God because we never are. But part of the deal is, is that, um, it's kind of like I was at, at Camp Malibu with Young Life up in British Columbia. Um, I don't know when it was, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and um, we had some 80-plus-year-old women come. And it is a difficult place to walk. Lots of steps, lots of hills, lots of long walks to get where you're going. And these women, you know, would just be like, <gasps> you know, just, but they made it. But, you know, I looked at him and I thought, I bet you didn't realize you were going to need a little more stamina than what you have. Has that ever happened to you where you go somewhere and you get there and you think, oh, sh I should have been walking two or three miles a day. <laughs> I, I should have been, uh, you know, building up my stamina for this thing. A lot of times what happens right after you have your children, you know, where you go, I should have prepared for this a little more. <laughs> um, what was I thinking? Nothing. I was thinking nothing. I had some friends, and they were bemoaning the fact of, of their child raising, and I said, it was a lot more fun to make them than raise them, isn't it? <laughs> and they looked at me, and I went, we got four. I mean, come on. You should have known something along the line <laughs> was going to blow up. Um, so <laughs> when, when we look at this particular passage, I just want us to go to the Word, and let's look at what it says. And then draw some, some uh, information from it. Uh, starting with verse 1, chapter 22 of Numbers. And I will re read from the New American Standard so you don't have to hear, hear the word ass a lot. Um, <laughs> since it seems to bother some of your sensibilities. <laughs> but it is biblical. It's a biblical <laughs> word. What am I saying? Y'all get it. Get, come on. And the sons of Israel journeyed and camped in the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan opposite Jericho. Now Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all the, that Israel had done to the Amorites. So Moab was in great fear because of the people, for they were numerous. And Moab was in dread of the sons of Israel. Moab said to the elders of Midian, Now this horde will lick up all that is around us as the ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of Moab at that time. So he sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor, at Pethor, which is near the 7-Eleven down by the river. <laughs> Every now and again, you've got to throw in something. You're like, oh, that's, that's just... <laughs> Lots of words. In the land of the sons of his people... To call him saying, behold, a people came out of Egypt. Behold. I mean, this dude says it all the time. They cover the surface of the land and they are living opposite me. Now, therefore, please come curse this people for me since they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I may be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed and he whom you curse is cursed. Um, sometimes you're going to run into people in our pagan time who believe in blessing and cursing by someone else, not by a religious person, but, but 
a soothsayer or um, in Africa, you know, we witch doctors. We don't call them that here, but but um, those of the darkness, if if you will, and. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the fees for divination in their hand. And they came to Balaam and repeated Balak's words to him. He said to them, spend the night here and I will bring word back to you as the Lord may speak to me. Now he did communicate with the Lord. And the leaders of Moab stayed with Balaam. Then God came to Balaam and said, who are these men with you. I always love it when God asks questions he already knows the answer to. <laughs> it's kind of like when he brings Abram out and he says, you know, count the, the stars in the heavens. <laughs> Is that rhetorical? Or you're at one, 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 two, three. I think I already counted that one. one. <laughs> Who are these men with you? He says to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent word to me. Behold, there is a people who came out of Egypt, and they cover the surface of the land. And now come, curse them for me. Perhaps I may be able to fight against them and drive them out. God said, said to Balaam, do not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. So Balaam arose in the morning and said to Balak's leaders, Go back to your land, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. The leaders of Moab arose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refused to come with us. Then Balak again sent leaders more numerous and more distinguished than the former. It's a very important part of this story. He did not quit. He just sent bigger guys. This happens to us sometimes. When sometimes we're tempted with things, when the first wave does not work, the second wave is sent in. We need to be very careful. We need to live very simply. We need to live very close to, to listening to the Lord. And Because and, we don't know everything. At least I don't. I, I, I mean, maybe y'all do. I need to move where you are if, if, if you know everything. But we are having to, to seek the Lord, and, and we need to be careful when we say, the Lord told me, or I've heard from the Lord, because I have to add the caveat, I think, I believe. I believe I've heard from the Lord. You know, Lord, make this clear to me, what we're to do here. And it said, so they said, he sent these people, more distinguished and more numerous than the former, they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak the son of Zippor, Let nothing I beg you now hinder you from coming to me, for I will indeed honor you richly, and I will do whatever you say to me. Please come then, curse this people for me. Balaam replied to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his houses full of silver and gold, I could not do anything, either small or great, contrary to the command of the Lord my God. Now, remember, back with, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what they said was, it does not matter that you have this, this idol. It does not matter that everyone in the whole world is going to bow. We are not going to bow. It doesn't matter what you say. We're not going to do that. And in some respects, we see this, this Gentile, uh, Balaam, saying the same thing to this very powerful king of, you know... Uh, it doesn't matter how much you give me. You can fill up all your houses with silver and gold, and I cannot do anything apart from what the command of the Lord. And he says here, the Lord my God. Now, please, you also stay here tonight, and I will find out what the Lord shall speak to me. Now, what caught me here is that God has already told him what the first time. Don't go. Don't go. So he sends these other people, and he says, stay the night, I'll go back and check <laughs> to see if God has changed his mind. <laughs> I, sometimes I do that. If I don't get the answer I want, or if there's being, you know, their pressure, you know, I, I, well, let me go back and see. But here Balaam goes back, and then it said, God came to him at night and said to him, if the men have come to call you, rise up and go with them. But only the word which I speak to you shall you do. 
So Balaam arose in the morning and saddled his donkey <laughs> and went with the leaders of Moab. But God was angry because he was going. Now, did God tell him to go? Go back, look. He did. First of all, he told him, don't, don't curse these people. Okay? So he goes back and he says, I'm not doing it, not cursing. And then they come back and they say, you know, whatever. And he says, let me go. And God says, okay, you go with them. But he's already told them you can't curse them. So what, what are you going to do there? We don't know, right? I love reading the word, especially when we don't know. I love it when a speaker says, what do you think? I don't have a big word of God here. I just read the words. And it says he's angry because he was going. And the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. Now he was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, the donkey turned off from the way and went into the field. But Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back into the way. Who saw the angel? The enlightened man? No, his ass saw the, the angel. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path of the vineyard with a wall on the side and a wall on that side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pressed herself to the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. He's beaten his donkey. because And she's been a faithful donkey. We're about to find out because she has a conversation with him. <laughs> the angel of the Lord went further. And stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn to the right hand or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. So Balaam was angry and, and struck the donkey with his stick. So she was doing everything she could to do what? Save her master. The enlightened man. And the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey. God, don't you love God? <laughs> he opened up the mule's mouth. And she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? See, this is a man who he has known in his place to be able to curse people or bless people. But he cannot even see the angel of the Lord standing in the way with a drawn sword. And, and the smart one in the family is the ass, <laughs> is the donkey. The one God opened his mouth to bring forth truth. You and I need to be looking for God and where he's going to speak in many different places. It's not always your pastor. It's not always Beth Moore. It's not always famous people. It's just normal people. It's just maybe animals. I learn a lot from animals. Um, the ground, the dirt. Uh, a lot of times it's taking the time to stop and listen. It's like listening to your music. The, the intricacy of the chords that are there. The, the, the way the, the melodies weave together. The way she does the chords on the piano. The way the beat of the drum, the, 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 the bass, the melodies of the ladies. It is a, 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 a um, not a puzzle, but, but a, a weaving together of elements that become something that is speaking to your heart. And so when this donkey says to him, why are you, why have you stuck, struck me three times? And he's just not like tap, tap, tap. He's beating the fire out of this donkey. And he says to the donkey, because you've made a mockery of me. If there had been a sword in my hand, I would have killed you by now. 
Sometimes your children are going to give you God's truth. And sometimes when things happen to you and it, and, and it, it aggravates you, I'm, I'm sure that hasn't happened to any of y'all, but maybe someone you know <laughs> has gotten aggravated by circumstances or, you know, the kids aren't doing or life's not doing and you, you, you just feel it kind of, you know, kind of going up here and you're... And it just takes one little thing, just one little fly... Uh, of an uh, ounce of, of weight to, to, to set you off and you become this raving something and all of a sudden you realize what an idiot you are. <laughs> Mommy, why are you so angry? Didn't we pray this morning for God to lead us? Yes. Yes, sweetheart. Yes, we did. We're not perfect, but sometimes we get so full of ourselves Balaam's pretty full of himself. Um, that we forget to slow down, to be quiet, to listen. And when, when we begin to feel ourselves, and I see this in the church, when we begin our, to feel ourselves getting stressed, we just need to step back. Just get out of that moment. No, you don't owe anyone anything. Do you hear me? People will push you. Balak's pushing him. You know, the donkey is trying to save. God has put his, his angel with a drawn sword. And I think it's interesting because when Balaam says, if I'd had a sword in my hand, I would have killed you. Well, guess who does have a sword in his hand? <laughs> well, you could have barred the angels after he killed you. When we really look at the scripture, when we really look at the stories and start pulling out those different things and say, what is it in my world that God has protected me from and I punish someone else? Do you ever do that? Do you ever pass on to someone else that anger when in fact God has prevented things from happening to you? But it's in hindsight that you look at it and wonder well, here, he says, I would have killed you by now. Verse 30, the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you have ridden all your life to this day? Have I ever been accustomed to do so to you? And he said, No. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam. So God had closed Balaam's eyes, and he could not see the angel. Not only did he open the the donkey's mouth, he had opened the donkey's eyes and he was able to see the angel. And, and, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand and he bowed all the way to the ground. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out as an adversary because your way was contrary to me. Now, I know we're in this big classroom here. I don't usually have this many in my class. But let's take a moment as students and say, okay, here's the, here's the situation. These men come to him, say, you know, curse these people. He says, let me check with God. God says, nope. He comes back, he says, nope. And they go back and they tell him and they come back with more stuff and, and, and whatever. And he goes back and he asks God another time to see if he really meant what he meant the first time he told him no. God will use our own stupidity to teach us about our own stupidity. We need to be careful. We serve a holy God. We serve a God who doesn't play around or mince words. When we come and seek his face and he gives us an answer, it's not that he holds it against us that we are fearful or we don't understand, but sometimes it is because I do not like the answer God gives me. And that's what I find a lot in my world. People say, well, I prayed for God to fix this for me, and he didn't, so he must not be God. I've lived that in my own life. You know, I have not been a grateful daughter to the Lord, a grateful servant. And it just humbles me to realize that God probably has preserved my life a lot for my own stupidity when he could have killed me. And you know what? If I had been God, I would have killed me. <laughs> it's like the disciples. You know, you think about the, the disciples. They never got it. All the time Jesus is having to explain to them, 
No, that's not what I meant. You know, in John 11, when Lazarus is dying and they send the word, the sisters send the word to, to them. And, and, and uh, when they, they said, you know, the one whom you love is sick. Well, you know, Mary and Martha wanted to remind him that it was not just any Lazarus, but that it was the Lazarus he loved that was sick. So to quit what you're doing with those strangers and come over here and heal my brother. And Jesus said, well, I'm glad this sickness is not unto death. I'm glad that he's just asleep. And so the disciples are like, yay, he's just asleep. And they say, do you think you're going there again? Don't you remember that the last time we were there, they said they were going to kill you when you came back? And, and he said, you know, and we don't want to go there. Because uh, once they kill Jesus, who else are they going to kill? The disciples. Okay. So even then, Jesus doesn't say, y'all about the dumbest men I have ever run across. And, 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 and if I had been Jesus, I would have killed every one of them. And if they had asked dumb questions, I'd have killed that group. And then the word would have gotten around, do not ask dumb questions of Jesus. But see, that is not the Savior we serve. He is, he is a loving, he understands our limitations. And even in this, God allowed the donkey to speak the truth to him. And then after he had to answer that, no, you have faithfully served me, I did not need to, just because he's a dumb am, animal doesn't mean you have the right to beat him, which sometimes we do that. I saw that in my own home. My father felt like he had the, the privilege to do whatever he wanted in punishment to me, to, to take care of his own angst or rage or anger or whatever. And I understand about that donkey. This particular passage, I totally understand because sometimes those are the things that happen to us when we are not with people who are here in the Lord. And so when God opened the eyes of Balaam and he saw that that angel was there, and he says, let's see, where's that verse? Um, verse 33, but the donkey saw me and turned aside from me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, I surely would have killed you just now and, and let her live. <laughs> I, I like that verse. <laughs> I would have let you die, Mr. Big Shot. And let her live. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. Now, here's where we are. In our lives, my, my exhortation to us tonight is that you may not have any idea about this kind of story. But if something in this weekend that you might in your heart say, you know what? I've sinned. I, I've, I've sinned against God. I have not been obedient. I have not been faithful. Or I've been an idiot. I mean, that's a, a real realization that we have. Those epiphanal moments where you go, I've been an idiot. I just didn't even understand. I just didn't realize. I was acting out in who I am, and God wants to change me. And he says, I have sinned, for I did not know that you were standing in the way against me. Now then, if it is displeasing to you, I will turn back. Well, now he says he'll turn back. Go back to the beginning of the story. It's like when your children come and they say to mama, can I go to the lake? And mama goes, no. And then they go to daddy and say, daddy, can I go to the lake? And he says, sure, it sounds good to me. Because he didn't know you said no. Right? So it's kind of like playing that off of each other. And here he says, if, oh, you know, if you don't really want me to go, I won't go. But you told me to go. Well, it's after I told you no, you can't curse them but then you came back and asked me again so I let you go and now you're learning to, to live by what you know you're reaping what you've sown and then it says but the angel of the Lord said to Balaam go with the men but you shall speak only the word which I tell you well don't you think Balaam by this time is getting it we have an humbled Gentile prophesier here and you know, what I get here is I can't unequivocally say he was an evil man because when you get to Revelation, I think it's chapter 2, it talks about how Balaam is the one that told Balak after this time, I can't curse these people, but if you get them enticed with your women and your gods, then they will follow after them and he caused them to sin. 
And it says in Revelation, Balaam is the one who did that. Later on, Balaam does die by the sword because he is in the battle with the wrong group. So he is not a man that we go, oh, he was a great guy and he just made a mistake. No, he was not. Okay? And, and he said, so, but in this point, it said, you're not going to say anything except what I tell you. So it says, he went along with the leadership. When Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went out to meet him at the city of Moab, which is on the... An Arnon border at the extreme end of the border. Then Balak said to Balaam, did I not urgently send to you to call you? Why did you not come to me? Okay, now he's getting rasped by the guy because he's taking so much time. Am I really unable to honor you? So Balaam said to Balak, behold, I have come now to you. Am I able to speak anything at all? The word that God puts in my mouth, that shall I speak. And Balaam went with Balak, and they came to this other place. And Balaam sacrificed oxen and sheep and sent some to Balaam and the leadership who were with him. I want to... This is long convoluted. Let me just get to the chase. What the bottom line is, is this is a pagan king who is sacrificing to their pagan gods so there would be some movement on Balaam's behalf to do what he wants him to do. And Balaam is going along with it. Okay, so it's we need to be careful that as Christians, sometimes people will come to us and ask us things. We need to realize that don't get up all into their business if they're people who do not worship God because the evil is real. And here he goes and they keep sacrificing in the holy places. And and you see it in verse 41. Then it came about in the morning that Balak took Balaam and brought him up to the high places of Baal. And he saw from there a portion of the people. Now, he does not curse the Israelites because God has told him not to. But what he, he... dabbles in is the dark deeds of this king. So my encouragement to you is to be careful with whom you spend your time as far as revealing yourself to people. Does that make sense? However, we're to be with the people of the world. So when we realize that we don't want to be like Balaam, we don't want to be the one where they come and say, hey, I heard you healed somebody, right? Would you pray for us and heal us? And it's like, well, I will pray, but you need to know that I'm praying in the name of Jesus, and it is for the gospel. Where is your heart? Well, what has my heart got to do with it? Well, the healing is one thing, but the healing of your heart is the most important thing. So for us to rightly divide the word of truth is that we realize sometimes we show our own mule ass in the fact that we do not live lives in in the way that we want people to see Jesus in us. I want you to be impressed with how well I teach. I want you to be impressed with how, what a character, you know, good character I am or person of integrity I am. I don't really want you to know that I am a sinner saved by grace and I cuss, smoke, drink, and all that stuff. I really don't do all those things, but you have to figure out which ones I don't do. But it is the righteousness of God that we bring to people. Does that make sense? So we don't want to be known for our lack, do we? We want to be known for what we've done. I mean, even in this campground, you want to be known as the premier place in the world. You want to be known for the excellence that you do. And it's very difficult when you realize the whole thing is about the gospel and and. For us to realize that today could be our last day. So in this day, have I been kind to you? Have I been kind to the people with the 14,000 dogs on the sidewalk? (laughs) Actually, it wasn't the 14,000 dogs on the sidewalk. It was the the family of 10 people who pushed us off the sidewalk. (laughs) That was like... (laughs) 
bless their heart, yeah. <laughs> it usually happens when you're car, isn't it? I mean, you feel like you're in your own kingdom, you know? I become an Italian in my car. What you doing? <laughs> I had my blinker on. Blink, 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 blink. What are you doing? <laughs> or when, you, when there's that merge lane and you really got into traffic way back here and then these people want to merge and you're like, no. <laughs> you know, you start doing your hair in the car, you know. You don't even look that way. You don't even <laughs> glance. And they're this far from your car, and it's like, go ahead, I got insurance. Come on. <laughs> I'm not giving up my place. And I realized, what is wrong with you? Nothing. They can't get in your place. <laughs> when you talk to yourself, be careful. It, it, it gets real confusing. Because you usually think you're right. <laughs> But in that way of don't be that, be the people that other people know that when you pray, something happens. Does that make sense? But be careful of the people in our world who claim to be of God, but they are not of God. I, I, it's, a very, it's a very fine line these days. And... I don't even know. I, I wasn't sure about preaching this tonight. I, I really had something else, and, and I, I didn't know. But for some reason, we're supposed to talk about Balaam and his ass. And, and how sometimes in our own lives, we make these mistakes when we have been dense. But in that, it is good when we once realize and have the epiphany we have been that we go, I have sinned. I am sorry, Lord. And he doesn't hold it against us. In this night, as we've come to this point, we talked about Hagar. And in that chapter, right before Hagar's chapter, is when God comes to Abram to, to make a covenant with him. And that's why the children of Israel camped uh, you know, all over and, and, and made uh, Balak very nervous and he wanted to kill them is because God had blessed those people. They were his. And when he comes to Abram and, and he promises him in Genesis 15 is where he makes the covenant with Abram. And I've taught this before. You will see it on one of, or hear it on one of the ones. But I think it's the underpinning of everything I've been talking about. Is that I believe as Christians, we don't know the full story of how God entered into covenant with Abram. And then through that, he's, we have the covenant in Jesus with God. And we see it every time we take the Lord's Supper. Okay, It's the evidence, it's, it's the the reminder of the covenant that God entered into with Jesus on our behalf. And so if you go back and you read that chapter, it says that, that God told Abram to go get these animals, to cut them in half, and what happened, the, 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 what they did was, as I said last night, they put them on a sloped place, the blood would run down, so there would be the walk of death. And there would be a... A process that they would follow. If, if It's a little bit like our wedding ceremony, although it's watered down. Our wedding ceremony is watered down from our actual covenant ceremony. And what happened, one, one of us, if I were entering into covenant with you, we would stand and face one another. And there would be the process of, I would give you my cloak, and I would say, this is to represent that from this day forward, all that I have is as yours. And you would give me yours. I would take off my weapons, which in that time you didn't give people your weapons because you had tested them in battle and you did not do that. But I would give you my weapons and I would say, this is to represent that me and mine, if your enemy gets to you, that means we're dead because we will fight to the death to protect you. And you would the same with me. We would have a little bit of fire going on back here and we'd have something cooking back here with salt in it. And I would take something from that and I would feed it to you and I would say, this is to represent me. We're taking in one another. And from this day forward, we are as one. And you would do the same thing with me. That's why we have cake at the reception. I don't know what all we have now, but used to. Cake would have salt. Salt is the covenant binder. 
So the very thing in the reception that we all laugh about and cram, you know, cake into each other, actually that's one of the most sacred parts of it because you're taking in with one another and that is sealing the covenant with salt. I would take part of your name. God said to Abram later on, your name shall become Abraham, Yahweh, the breath of God. So Abraham has part of God's name. And Sarah shall be called Sarah, the breath of God. She took on part of God's name. So from that day forward, the, God's name was part of their names. And then in that ceremony, there would be this walk of death where some, some teachers say that they would walk, they would do a figure eight between the pieces of the animals. Some people said they went right down the middle where the blood was as they walked through the blood. And when you got to the other end, the, I, I would say to you, may this happen to me if I break this covenant with you. And you would say the same to me. And the last part of the covenant ceremony, I would take my firstborn son and I would say, from this day forward, he is as yours. As long as he remains alive, we will be at peace. We found this out through, um, uh, I read it in the book, Peace Child, about the Papua New Guineas. Uh, in Papua New Guinea, the people that they discovered there, they could never find a language to show them about the, the, a redeemer. Until one day they saw a covenant ceremony and they saw the chief bring his son to this chief and say, as long as this peace child remains alive, there will be peace between our people. And that's when the missionaries realized that's the ticket. That's who Jesus is. He's the peace child. And some people say, as I said before, when God asked Abraham to bring Isaac to sacrifice him on the altar, then that freed up God to be the next part of the ceremony where he gave his son as the first child, the peace child, the peace between us. So when you, as an adult, understand that you don't get born into Christianity, you don't get born into a relationship with Jesus, you have to say, I do. Have you ever been to a wedding where people are standing and facing one another, and he says to the man, will you take this woman to be your wife? And he says, hmm? <laughs> hmm? Um. No, you have to say something. You know, I will, I'll try, I hope. You know, there, there is some sort of commitment that you make in this covenant ceremony. You have to enter into a covenant. You don't slide in. You don't get born in. You are entering into that. And so when you become a Christian, when the people in your world become Christians, you bring to them to that covenant place and saying, you are entering into a covenant with holy God himself, and he shall never break it. But you have to say, I do. You have to say, yes. And in that transaction, we are in covenant with God. Through Jesus. Because why? Do you remember that part in, in, in that chapter in Genesis? He caused Abram to go to sleep. He put him into a deep sleep. And then all the stuff that happened in there, God did himself because he knew Abram could never fulfill the covenant because he would die. God would have to kill him. He would break it. He is human. He is Balaam. He, is make, he makes mistakes. Well, he's not Balaam, but he makes mistakes. And so, therefore, I never knew that God didn't look at me as Roseanne. He looked at me through the lens of Jesus. That's the only way he can look at us is through Jesus because Jesus paid the price. He fulfilled the covenant promise, if you will, the payment. And so when God looks at you, he sees Jesus first and we're in Jesus. So many scriptures are talked about we're in Christ. No matter what denomination you're in. And I'm not trying to trounce on anybody if you're baptized when you're a baby. I'm not talking about anything like that. At some point in your life, you need to say, I do to Jesus. And I've talked to lots of people, older people, who've said, I've never understood that. 
I never realized I had to say I do to follow God. You know, in the Baptist church, we'd go, give your heart to Jesus. Let him live in your heart. And we go, I want to give my heart to Jesus. And I never really realized in that transaction, I said I do at five years old. I wanted to give my, I wanted, that relationship was something I wanted. Did I understand it? No. Just like most of us didn't, and I've not been married, but most of you when you got married, did you understand what you were getting into? <laughs> I've sat across a lot of coffee cups of a lot of ladies who said, what have I done? We would pray, 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 pray for them to get engaged. And they would pray, 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 pray for everything with the wedding. And then after the wedding, we would pray, pray, pray she wouldn't kill him, you know. <laughs> and then we would pray, pray, pray for babies. And then when the babies come, we would pray, pray, pray she wouldn't kill them. It's just an amazing process. We never know what we're getting into and what we're asking for, the thing that we desire the most in the whole world. And we don't have a clue. Maybe we should pray for the donkey to speak. And tonight, that's me. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, some of us are on the wrong path. Some of us don't really understand what we're doing. We don't understand what's going on. We, we're not really sure. But maybe sometime, someplace in this weekend, there's been a, a time where uh, you have tugged at the heart of one of these ladies or someone who's listening um, through our recording. And maybe there's someone here tonight who needs to think about, have you ever really said, I do? And if you're not sure, maybe tonight's the night that you want to make sure that you have put a stake in the ground, and from now on, this would be the day with this donkey that you would say, I gave my I do to Jesus. I said I do to the Lord. And Father, I pray for the people who are broken, who have said I do, but have been crushed and, and difficulty in life and, and, and tragedy and disappointment. And that life has not turned out like they hoped. Father, I pray that the bomb of Gilead would be all, all over them. That would, would be, they would be poured over by your spirit to bring the peace and healing that they need. And Father, I pray if there's some lady here tonight or someone here tonight who's never said I do to you, that they would pray this prayer to you. Lord, I want to belong to you. I want to enter into covenant with you. I say I do. I, I want to, to be that faithful servant to hear you and I want to be on that path of being in relationship with you. Thank you that you hear my prayer. If you, with your head still bowed, if anyone prayed that prayer tonight, I pray that you would just raise your hand and let me see you. I would like to pray a prayer over you. I pray over you in the name of Jesus, my new sister in the Lord. I welcome you to the kingdom. And I pray that the Lord would put you in a place where you can be taught and you can understand who you are in the Lord. And I, I, I pray over that journey. And I'm so glad you're my sister in Christ. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I bless you in the name of Jesus, my new sister in Jesus. I pray that you would understand that he's called you from before the foundation of the world to walk in the, in the fullness of who he is. I pray that you would know that you've never been alone and you shall never be alone. And that he has blessed your path. That he has, he has planned ahead of time of who you are. And I pray that you would know that the fulfillment of that in your life. And I bless you in the name of Jesus. And I welcome you to the kingdom. Not my new sister in the Lord. Someone else, if I ha can't see you, would you just sort of put your hand up and, and wave at me? Someone else who wants to say, I do to the Lord, or you want to make sure this is, this is what you, who you are. Father, thank you for these new sisters in Christ. I thank you that 
that you've allowed me to be a part of that process, this camp to be a part, of this conference center to be a part of that process. Thank you, Father, that it's never too late in the moments that we live in this life. We don't have to worry, but we just continue to pray. We pray for one another. As we look at the events of the world, Father, give us courage. May we be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. May we not bow the knee. Whether you do deliver us in the way that we would hope, may we say with them, and even if he does not, we shall not bow down to your idol. Father, help us to be that convinced that you are that close to us, that it does not matter what you allow to happen to us. It matters what you're what brings you glory in this world, Father, through us. And I thank you. I thank you, Father, for the opportunity in this night to speak well of your name once again. For you are faithful. And it's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen.